Good morning and welcome to the webinar Cloud Native Labs in the Austrian Open Cloud Community, which is a part of the webinar series Research Data Management in Austria. So uh, before we begin, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, as always, please keep your mic muted during the webinar, uh, unless there is a Q&A session and you want to ask your question directly. Um, during the presentations, I would ask you to please ask your questions in the chat. There will be plenty of, of breaks and short Q&A sessions throughout the webinar, so you will have time to uh, ask all your questions then as well. So let me talk for a little bit about the webinar series, Research Data Management in Austria. So the series uh, started in 2020 and uh, it's in both researchers and research support staff to create opportunities for networking and to provide the community with um, uh, current information on uh, various aspects of research data management. Uh, for example, how to write a data management plan. You can find the links to all the slides and the recordings of our previous events, which are almost, we're nearing 30 by now. Uh, and you will find all of those on our project website, as well as um, the on our YouTube channel. So this is also where you will find uh, the recording from today's event. Uh, so for our agenda today, um, after the welcome that provided by me, Teresa Kalova, I work at the University of Vienna. We will, uh, I will pass um, over to Constanze Rödig, who will tell you uh, all about what uh, the project Austrian Data Labs and Services uh, has been doing. Uh, and there will be also a live demo, and again, plenty of time to for um, your questions. So uh, let me now introduce our speaker. Dr. Constanze Rödig, uh, who works at TU Wien. Uh, so Constanze earned her doctorate at the Albert Einstein Institute in Relativistic Radiation Hydrodynamics, and she continued studying black holes at John Hopkins as a postdoc. And uh, after she spent eight years in the private sector as a software architect to enable companies to transition their internal systems towards transparent um, performance and scalable designs. Um, uh, the desire to give back to the community brought her back to science um, in the role of the technical lead for an Austrian wide project, ADLS, Austrian Data Lab and Services, to make high performance computing more accessible and bring cloud native to the university system landscape. Uh, Constanze also advocates for open standards now, as well as fair and open science. She works as an uh, R&D engineer on finding feasible means to unite HPC with the modern user experience of Kubernetes. So Constanze, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Teresa. So let me just share my screen. And one sec. Wonderful. So first of all, thank you for the invite. Thanks for giving us the platform here to share in our sister project, essentially. So the Austrian Data Lab and Services project is the sister project of Fair Data. And we have a very similar idea in general. It's about digitalization in the Austrian landscape and making, in this case, the runtimes, not the data so much, but the runtimes shareable, collaborative, and open. And also to integrate university system landscapes amongst each other. This is where the whole cloud idea comes into being. First of all, all of you, and I think I know almost none of the uh, audience member, Happy New Year. And I hope you had a great start into 2023. For us as a project, it was definitely a big change because we are now in the public, in the open. We also have a new logo that you see here, the Austrian Open Cloud Community. Um, and we have a first batch of stuff um, being open sourced. And this is also going to be what I'm partially talking about today. Don't worry, this is not a technical talk. This I hope to really motivate the use cases and the benefit that um, users as well as admins, as well as engineers can have from 
um, these cloud and open science ideas. With that being said, a bit of a disclaimer, there will be logos. There's also, um, I will be talking about Pokeballs, which is one of our code names. We do not intend to be sued by Nintendo. Um, neither are any of the other logos. Um, in case they are somehow copyrighted, please point it out if we're using them wrong. Um, we do not intend or endorse any of the vendors uh, or otherwise copyrighted intellectual property. With that away, um, a little bit of the stats. So we started um, as, again, a Bundesministerium funded project in June 2020. So it's been a while. We had some issues with staffing, which is why we've been extended until the end of December 2024. So we are now sort of in the middle of the project, meaning we have prototypes, the first um, working ideas have crystallized out of a large amount of ideas that we've brainstormed. And it starts to, to get real this year. Who is our beneficiary? All Austrian universities, theoretically also non-Austrian people. So this is completely open, of course. Um, and who are we? Primar primarily serving. These are research groups, especially around the high performance compute sector, but not only. Teaching itself, and there are two parts in the teaching. One is um, we try to teach cloud native um, to our fellow engineers and students, um, as well as we enable teachers, like professors, to use one of these platforms, which we're going to talk about, which is called Jupyter. Um, to um, especially in computer science, programming and data science, to have these interactive teaching environments and have them extensible, for example, with grading tools. And then it is that Centrale Informatikdienst. This is where we're kind of going to start with the whole cloud element, because typically an individual professor doesn't buy a cloud or a data center. Um, this tends to be on institute level or even on, on country level where we buy the big infrastructure pieces. And our specific goal in this year is to start establishing a community and to also understand where are the concrete use cases, both in research as well as in teaching, where we can help, where we can interoperate, where we can collaborate, and to build those out uh, ideally together. This also reflects in the way we are organized. We are we try not to use the logos, we try not to care about which university we're from. Um, it's a it's a scrum team, so we use the agile methodology. Um, somewhat improvised sometimes. Formerly, uh, Tiovin leads um, the project, so we hold the budget essentially. But we also have transitioned it, and it's quite interesting from a hiring perspective. So, where this project started with percentages of budget for each university, we now have a model where if a university or a new engineer comes in and wishes to work at, let's say, Uni N or let's say uh, Uni Innsbruck, um, then the money for, if we have the budget, of course, um, would go to that university. So we try to keep this as flexible and on demand and as flat as we possibly can. Now, this is the team. So we have some team members have recently joined. I don't have photos from them yet. Um, we have been growing quite a bit. We even have our first master student who does research on the platform started in September, so that's quite interesting as well. And um, the team has been steadily growing. Some people have, of course, also already left uh, students finish, of course. But um, what you also see here, primarily, we try to not care uh, who you are, where you're from. Um, the only thing that we hope is that you find in our stack or in our um, approach something that you like to contribute and that ideally is what you can do no matter where you're from. Now, the agenda today, I would like to point out three main use cases for such an open cloud community. I will start with um, Jupyter, which is this teaching tool. And however, this time, it's not going to be about teaching classes to students. Um, the focus of this example is how to do open science. We have a collaboration ongoing with Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And, and we have, and they got funded by NASA to open source their code base on Geospace, um, their Geospace code base. And we wanted to help them 
using our infrastructure. So they are a research group. They are primarily physicists and mathematicians. And we as engineers wanted to see how can we collaborate and how much effort is that? And that's something I want to, to show and some learnings from there. And there is going to be a little bit of, of tech as well. Like what did we have to do to this teaching platform to make this possible? Was this hard? And also this Kubernetes thing, which is a container orchestrator. Um, what did we need to change there? Or what was specifically difficult or is a specific focus point we must not forget in our designs? The second part is to teach students what cloud native is. What is DevOps? What And also why is security, cybersecurity so relevant in today's world? Um, here we have, I think, not just in Austria, but everywhere, a, a tremendous lack of uh, trained workers in the workforce. And we basically said, well, we, we're building this um, cloud anyway. Why not just teach it at a larger scale? And here I would like to talk a little bit about the approach. So how we, well, how I believe that it's going to be um, sustainable and also a good learning experience. And then also a, an idea that we have in a, in a different collaboration with the informatics department at TUV in security and privacy, how we can use uh, gamified exams, uh, specifically capture the flag events to have um, or to have a means, a platform to test real practical skill and knowledge in an exam rather than multiple choice or any of the other, let's say a bit more traditional approaches, which may not work in an engineering subject. Mm -hmm. And then the last part is, so we've open sourced something and possibly you're interested, in it, hopefully. Um, so how can you get involved? What is the benefit from universities and where are we? How can you interact with us? Um, and also, um, yeah, basically how to get started. So I will pause every five minutes or so. So if you have a question, put it in the chat and I hope to uh, react to it in almost real time. So from the perspective of a Zentrale Informatik Dienst, that's it. Um, it is a lot more efficient nowadays, especially with the current inflation and energy costs to condense um, some of the infrastructure that used to be very specific and maybe e each institute had their own infrastructure. Um, now with a lot of commodity tools and standards coming into the uh, coming into the world and being also used by universities, it is a lot more money efficient to share these infrastructures and to learn from each other and also to exchange this best practices. And what we're seeing at this picture is the idea that in the middle, we're basically developing blueprints, trying out um, and testing ideas, incubating them with individual poster child use cases, and then to do this in such a way that we can share this with other institutes as long as they implement the same standards or what we say is abstraction layers. And that is basically the, the let's say, institute focus of this uh, project and which is why it was for a very long time, a very deeply technical and very abstract project to present. Now, something that is much more on the user level is well, how am I gonna use this platform now, now that it's sort of, of alive in a, in a development version to collaborate securely? Because one thing that will come up a little bit over the talk is that whenever we make something open, but it's not just like, let's say code itself, but we want to have a, an actually live environment that I want to share with someone else. We have the issue that these live environments tend to be exploitable. So in order to do this in a way that especially a university doesn't um, shoot themselves in the leg, essentially, um, we need to do this in a way that um, it's cost efficient, but still within a risk profile that we can accept. Now, let me come to the first use case, but maybe I'll, t I'll pause here real quick in case somebody already has a remark. And support the local community, uh, the, the local industry in Austria. <laughs> right, then let's get started with the first use case open science in HPC. So, what you see in the symbolism, which is going to repeat in the entire talk, we have on the left hand side this research application. This is, this is Git. Git is a version control system. 
And this symbol basically stands for typically a research group having um, a shared code base. This code base could be private or public. This, we do not make any assumptions here, but it, it doesn't have to be Git, but we just assume this is the most common one. Then in the middle, we have these sort of packages. One is this fish-like one, um, which is a container. It symbolizes a container. The other one is sort of one of these containers, which is um, typically a single package in therein. And what we see on the right hand side is the so called runtime. Now we have an instantiated lab in which, in this case, we do magnetohydrodynamics collaboratively. So that's what this picture is supposed to show us. And let's see um, why we would do that. Now, I work at TU Wien. Maybe you know that we have a high performance computer here in house, which belongs to many Austrian universities. It's called the Vienna Scientific Cluster. And now, one of the, let's say, use cases or asks from the ministry to us as a project is, how can we make high performance computing more interactive, easier to learn, shareable and fair? Okay, how, how is that supposed to work? Or how, why is it hard, actually, first? Now, high performance means it's typically highly optimized. And it's also very niche, typically. Um, the problem is there's a lot of knowledge bound up in such a code. Oftentimes, these code bases have been developed for decades. And now, one question is really, how do we translate this knowledge, this accumulated knowledge from one person's head to another in the easiest way possible? And one of the ideas is to publish catalogs of tutorials where a lot of the very technical, nasty, uh, gritty details are hidden away from the user when they have first contact with such a code base. And that's what we're going to look at in, in the next couple of slides. Another, and I think very, very important point is, and that's because I used to work in HPC myself, I'm a physicist. Um, so the, the code maintainers of these code bases are oftentimes not incentivized to do fair and open, open source. They are often incentivized to publish papers on their core research. So when they are asked to make this shareable, it tends to be more of a burden. Also to teach it can be backfiring onto these people's careers. And that is a shame. And I would, if there's anything we can do as a project to basically give the, let's say, engineering capabilities to make it easier for these researchers, typically the research engineers or senior research um, scientists, um, to make this easier, to share their code bases, and it's something that I think the project highly supports. Do you think it's something in the chat? Not just yet. Okay, perfect. Now, so this is one use case, open science labs. Now, what within this use case, we have different um, potential ways that we want to share um, code and insights. Let's go through them slowly. There's a lot of information on this slide. So when we do Open Science Lab for HPC, we're not talking about performing high performance compute code. So it's it's not the performance. That's, that's the one thing we take out here. What we want to achieve here is the portability and the translatability. Um, and the first use case that we want to implement is a so-called paper companion which is actually quite similar to what fair data does. Um, or let's say it integrates really well because essentially you publish a paper and it has a DOI and all these things. And how about, or how could we make it possible to also publish a mini version of an instantiatable uh, code base where a reader could interact with the plots and figures, um, render them differently, look at them in detail, maybe um, check some initial conditions files. These are typically a highly expert reader, so they would know what they look at, but they wouldn't just have to see um, one slice of the data. Um, and if you've ever visualized 3D data, you know this, that it's, it's very, very hard to choose in a paper where you have to pay for each color figure, which slice, which um, you know, viewpoint you, you, play, um, you display. It could be much more insightful to give someone the ability to turn a 3D figure around or to plot the different densities from color gradients, or maybe just different physical quantities that are typically many. Okay, I'm doing this always from a physics background, but this is not 
It's just because that's the only science that I uh, know a little bit about. Another use case very closely related to this is when we give papers into peer review. Um, to judge for a peer review or to judge if the, if the code that is being published or the results are actually trustworthy. This tends to be very hard to do as a reviewer because you typically don't see what actually happens. So if we could share at least test cases, algorithmic drift detection and these kinds of things, that could make it a lot easier for peer reviewers to judge at they did, the scientific method is legit. Then there are other use cases such as bank benchmarking, which is basically internal to a research team. Um, but then the other three are more in line with what we talked about earlier is when we onboard uh, new joiners, maybe students, um, how can we get into the subject easier? Then the other one, when we, when we simply teach how to use high performance compute bases in general how do we do how we make them efficient um, to make it easier to to simply present this to students without wasting endless time setting up like the laptops and making things run and and dealing with scripts until finally hours later you can just get started with the teaching just to to save that time and ideally maybe we can even give it in completely public outreach um, labs where we probably published a code with a little bit less detail to have the public consume it as they see fit. Now, this is one that we have hypothesized. This is the, the last one, the outreach one is the only one we have no data at, at all at the moment. An important assumption that we make is that institutes, I have to just um, change something here. Wow. Um, that institutes will probably not want to be dictated how they exactly host this. Um, admins are typically at the moment uh, at the capacity of their work, so we, we have to make it relatively easy. And in this case, users will be willing to sacrifice the performance. So we are not expecting anyone to run actual performance in these, in these labs. They're really for, for toys, review, or learning. And the other part, which at the moment we have to em emphasize is that the content itself should be public or at least not sensitive. So we're not putting anything in there at the moment at this, if you were to use any of our codes that is in any form secret or sensitive. So now we talked a bit about Jupiter before it was in the, maybe you saw it, it was in the big picture in the beginning. It's just a little bit of an interlude. What the hell is that? So for us, Jupyter, well, Jupyter in general is a web service platform where we can, via the browser, um, present an interactive environment to a user. And Jupyter Hub gives us the ability to do this in a multi-user fashion. So up to many hundreds of users, we can, we can share and we can control who has access to what. We can um, basically tailor a web session towards a user. So what we use from this essentially is that we can use on, on the server side, control an application and present it via a browser to a user. The rest, the data science part and the Python part is in, in this use case, not particularly relevant. Um, so basically it's an interactive environment and we, you do not on your laptop, tablet, desktop or otherwise machine that you have, you do not have any strong dependencies other that you have a relatively recent browser. So something like Chrome, Safari, or Firefox. And that is, that is the real big deal. For students, that's additionally a, a thing because it's of course a lot cheaper to have maybe a tablet than to buy an expensive laptop to, to really do a calculation because you're doing the calculation on the side of, of where the, the runtime, where the servers are running. So what does it look like? Um, so this is such an in, uh, interactive environment that we see here on the left. So you would open a shell. Actually, first thing that you find is, is on the right, you see such a login page, and then you have a drop down. You can select whatever the admin shared with you in this case, and you see that you have access in this case to this multi-scale uh, multi atmospheric ge geospace application. And then you have, you can choose a particular image version, in this case, the one from the um, 14th of December, and then you get a resource quota. 
And that's of course also pretty nifty to control, like some people need maybe to do rendering. Other times you wanna conserve money, maybe in the outreach um, perspective, you might wanna give people only very small amounts of CPU to consume. And now you select this image and now what boots up is what is seeing what you see on the left side. So basically a web environment where you can choose these so-called notebooks, which are very typical for Python. You can choose a console if you've ever worked in a terminal, a bash, or markdown files, or anything else, in fact, that the admin makes available to you. And here we have an example, which I hope is in the video visible, that um, some students at TUV in programmed a greater extension. So basically via a plugin me mechanism, they're giving us the ability here to use a grading system integrated um, in this Jupyter environment here that you see. And it's, I think also integrated with Moodle in this sp specific case and lets us grade submissions from students in the background, as long as we have this extension properly installed in the backend. So that's the interlude, what is Jupyter in general. And the cool thing for us is basically we control the application, the user only needs a browser, and we can also extend it with these fancy fancy uh, features such as in this case, the grader. All right, so now with an open science lab, another small interlude is because the word Kubernetes has already been, been said. Um, what is that? And when we talk about these layers, what what does that mean? So when we speak or when I speak about the layers, I typically think about three. So there's the data center itself, which I don't consider to be a layer. This is just somebody has hardware and typically cooling and electricity and all that stuff. Um, on top of that, what we do in, in a cloud sense is we say infrastructure as a service. So this is a cloud provider. A cloud provider can be public or private. So private is typical for when we want to save money, we already have the hardware. So in our case, we use for this open stack. It's not the only choice, but it's a, it's a common one. You could also maybe ha have a VMware. It's, it's not exactly the same thing, but um, it's also very common for people to have. Um, and what this gives us is the ability to create virtual machines on demand or to create network on demand. So instead of basically plugging cables in, we, we do commands or we have a browser-based interface where we can create virtual instances. And that is the cloud provider layer, the infrastructure as a service, virtual infrastructure as a service. Then we have the so-called platform layer. And here we choose the probably best known platform in the cloud world, which is called Kubernetes. And Kubernetes orchestrates, so it abstracts a virtual machine and virtual network from an application. It's sort of the middle thing because the application on top, in this case, Jupyter, runs in a container, which is an abstracted process or a prepackaged process. Um, but when you have lots and lots and lots of these containers, it gets extremely cumbersome to um, do the bookkeeping of what these containers are do, how many permissions somebody has, somebody has logged out, should we like delete this container now? Should we maybe scale up because there's more load? Should we scale down? All of this intermediate workflow, all of this orchestration that's done by the platform layer. And for that, we use Kubernetes. Yeah, and one thing that we really also try and that's also um, in line with, with cloud native is to do everything as a service, so this is AAS, but also as self-service as possible. So to make it scale, we try to use standards. And if you know what uh, VM is and what type of VM you need, then you would go to the infrastructure layer and you could provision yourself a VM. If you know that you need a particular um, Helm chart for Kubernetes, then you could go to Kubernetes and deploy that thing. If, however, your expertise level is more on the um, application side, and you are you want to have a new Jupyter extension and everything else you don't really care so much about, then you write a Jupyter extension, plug it onto the exist, existing Jupyter container image, and then update what Kubernetes is supposed to schedule for you. And the cool thing is that if we do these blueprints now, 
a user can choose which parts they want, which parts they want to exchange, and yeah, which parts they also just want to ignore because they say, well, this university might just not care about OpenStack at all. They might want to put it into Google Cloud. Fair enough. So they put it into Google Cloud. It's just a different um, payment model, essentially. Now, now we've introduced those layers. So coming back to the very beginning picture. So here is a lot going on. So what we just talked about is that what we want to give to the user is the top layer is the orange. We want to enable people to, or the end user, not to have to care about the lower levels pretty much. On the other hand, we want to also make it scalable and say, well, on a research group level, um, we want to give you something so canned and so standardly prepared um, that you can self-administer a so-called Kubernetes profile. So on the blue layer, what we are trying to do, and we're going to come back to that a couple of times, is we're trying to prepackage a very opinionated Kubernetes where you can choose a profile, for example, um, Jupyter for teaching or Jupyter for open science, um, such that most of these things that you see in these little bottles like pod security, SSO proxy and all that stuff uh, is sorted out for you. So basically all these, these blue individual uh, features become toggleable by us saying there's a profile and we call it Open Science Lab. And ideally, you, we can with you um, get that to run once. And once we have it running at an institute one time, you can repeatedly then uh, use it and change only the user layer, giving different containers to be scheduled on the blue layer. So that is really the idea here. On the right hand side, we see that we need for this to work and for this to be usable, we need a couple of things that we want to hide away from the end user, which is, for example, registries. Registries are the point where we share images. Images are applications that are built for this blue layer. And what we need to provide, of course, is a way for people to publish them there and another way for users and for also the clusters to pull them from there again. So, and for that, we need identity. Um, this means we need to have a means to identify users from different universities to be able to share with each other the same, okay, I'm Constance at TU Wien, but I'm also Constance at Universität Wien. Um, so I'm still the same person. And then there's always the question, do I have the same access if I'm as a different persona? And this is something I don't wanna talk about because it becomes technical here, but it's a, it's a very important question to figure out this integrated access management properly so that for the user, for the end user, it seems smooth. And whereas in the background, we have all this so-called federation going on. And the two lower levels, so OpenStack is in this case, our choice of cloud provider is private. So we have the infrastructure here. Um, and we use all, all of this automation tooling to make it scale. So we have very few maintainers that actually write this code and run it, um, but we can theoretically serve thousands of users because what we actually test is that this automation is extremely reproducible. And if you say, well, I want this um, Kubernetes, this platform profile, Open Science Lab in the version of January 23, then you can, or we can press a button or you can press a button and basically creates it for you. And for that, what we really need to test is all this automation that goes into hiding this complexity away from the user. And then the green layer is, um, I, for me at least, and ask questions here is relatively obvious, somewhere there needs to be the hardware. Um, and this can be either here in Vienna or it can be in a, in a public cloud provider where you've rented, or you can also go to, to uh, people like Hetzner, the data center as a service, essentially you pay people to give this to you for a premium. So this is um, do your own thing kind of. Right, wasn't I here before? Ah, that was the wrong button, sorry. All right, now let's go into the actual application that we have done this prototype with. So again, Nintendo, please don't sue us. We call them Pokeballs because we're um, extremely serious about this. Um, so essentially, um, the the code base is a is a Fortran code base about um, 
magnetohydrodynamics, and it has a lot of uh, monsters as logos. And so we said, well, we're going to put a monster in a container. And what is that? Especially if you have kids, uh, well, it's a Pokeball. And so um, to tame essentially the sometimes monstrous effort of, of getting these magnetohydrodynamic codes to run um, on a new infrastructure. And the use case that we're trying to do here is have this first interactive paper companion where we have public data on something called Globus or on Synodo that would be linked into such a runtime and you could have these figures interactively available to you. So what such a profile, this is what we call a profile, what is contained therein is maximally hardened Kubernetes. This means a very secure Kubernetes. It runs to Jupyter. It has custom Python images in order to allow us to do this, this rendering, this plotting. And it is able to talk uh, certain data mount points so that you can actually read and link to the data wherever that is externally stored, because typically in uh, high performance computing, those data sets are large. So we need to have inside there somewhere um, available as a tool, these mounting softwares. So, yeah, so now from the user side, let's talk about what do you need to do in order to do this from like research group perspective. So on the right side, if you really care, those are the detailed steps. I'm going to go for the left side, the high level steps. So let's say you're a research group, you think that's kind of cool. I want to do this too. So what do I need to do? Well, the first step is, and this is probably the, the nasty one, is you have to take your code apart and sort of categorize it into pieces that are, let's say, more stable, less stable, and containerize the thing, essentially. This typically involves many layers. And we've found that the best way of doing this is that you have one person who's really good at containerization and one person who really knows the code well. So you take basically a senior researcher and um, a DevOps engineer, cloud engineer, um, you let them sit for N weeks and eventually um, a container will come out of that. It also depends on what exactly you want there to be inside the container. Sometimes you just want these, these rendering features, but sometimes you might also want to, uh, for people to be able to compile your code or to debug your code with you if you want to have a shared debug environment. You know, so it depends how exactly you, you containerize, you package that application. Well, then you would create a, the lab cluster. Then you would publish your image and publish or push your image. That doesn't necessarily mean it's public to the world. It just means it's then shareable and it's deployable onto this cluster. And probably you'll have to iterate a couple of times until you, you really get it right. And then you could add interactive content like we saw earlier that you would have these nice plots and figures for end users to consume with whatever you published in that container. So what does it look like? Um, that's, that's an example. So here we see on the slide, this is Jupyter. This is on our environment. This is from a couple of days ago. Um, we see that a person from NCAR from the National Center of Atmospheric Research provided this ionospheric um, plot, which honestly, I don't particularly understand how it has something to do with current density, um, but it is from a summer school. And what is preloaded into there on the left-hand side is actual HPC data. So, so basically we have the Americans being able to log into our clusters, run their code here, and um, also visualize their data in, in Vienna in this uh, essentially. And now let's talk a little bit how, how we actually make this work, how this is, uh, how hard, how um, easy this is. So essentially what we do is we um, have many layers where we essentially want to allow people to do what we see in the bottom. So we have on the left-hand side, the, um, the drop down of what is available as an application um, before somebody shared it. So, so we have a Python standard image is on the top. Then we have this multi-scale atmospheric geospace environment uh, from that version of last December. And then there's a placeholder thing. So now let's say we want to work together and 
how many things do we have to do? So if we look in the top picture, so it would be someone in the, in the United States on their laptop pushing a uh, commit. So basically to their code base, they would commit something. What this thing does, it triggers the so-called build process. So we have previously defined how to containerize it. So that means we automated it now. So this automation now kicks in. And what happens is we build a new version of this container and share it. So a container is an immutable application image. That means I can do many things. I can, for example, sign that is really from me. Um, but here in this point, it's important to say I can share it. So I can say now this HPC app too is also available. And now the other thing I can do, I can also request a release of this. Um, so this is the, the lower part of this diagram is that I can say, well, I've published the application. Now, please schedule it, schedule it for me to, to give it to whoever has access to this cluster. And what essentially only happens, and this happens in seconds, is that this Kubernetes, um, if you have the right access, will change the references in this drop down and allow you to consume the image. And this is what you see on the right hand side. Now you have apparently done a new conductivity model. And now we can test this together. So everyone who has access to the right cluster can now act, um, test or see what happened in that newest ionosphere testing new conductivity model, whatever that may be. So how it actually works uh, practically. Um, so this is, this is actually slightly redacted from yesterday, but this is the real thing. Um, so this is the model, uh, this is the code base where people are working on this magnetohydrodynamics thing. So somebody pushed a change. Now what you see is that the build the Pokeball thing was kicked off. So this is um, this green um, icon. So this is step one, somebody published it. Now this actually, this build process. So hang on, let's go back one step, sorry. So this is a, is a repository that lives in the United States in this case, it's owned by JHU. Now this is owned by us. This is a pipeline and this build process actually runs in Vienna on a, on a VM that does this in, in OpenStack in this case. And so it builds and it would test that this build is correct. Now, the third step is now we're going to deploy it. So we're kicking up again, a completely different repository in this case, the open science repository automation that now does something it's called kubectl. This is kube control has to do with, it changes a couple of parameters and you see just looking at the seconds, how long that takes. Basically given the right application, given the right target, the only thing it changes a profile on a cluster. And now this image is available um, on this cluster. So that's basically how you, how you federate it. And the key part to get right is actually access, really, and orchestrating all these, these federated things. Right, I think, uh, did I click the wrong button again? Possibly. Um, what I wanted to also talk about is the data point. But I'll, I'll just pause a tiny bit. So Are here, there any questions? And also unmute yourself at this point. There are no questions in the chat currently. I guess we're good. So. <laughs> cool. So now you, you, we said, okay, data. So runtime was the part where we we were plotting this this object, and we get we made sure that all the libraries are in this immutable image that contains these um, contains the application which we want to abstract. So the only thing that, that the user can do is plot this. Now, how do we do the data? And you can see that there's a group share here on the left, and something called Jupiter Research Pokeball Student. Now this is a subfolder. And again, you have to be in, in a certain group and you have to be given permission to be member here. And then you can access 
in this case, this is test data, um, the HDF5 data that we downloaded from Cheyenne, which is a high performance compute cluster in Wyoming, I think. <laughs> um, so the, the point is that we and that this data also survives for longer. So I can go from cluster one, two, three, four, five, and maybe also a couple of weeks uh, in between, that this shared data will stay there. No matter even if we kill the compute environment completely, we change the application completely, that data will remain there unless somebody explicitly cleans it up. So those two things, so the state, the data, and the runtime are completely separated. And also the access controls are separated. So that, that gives us an, an enormous amount of flexibility to handle these use cases. And this is an example here of uh, Globus. Globus is a um, web, no, sorry, it's a data transfer protocol essentially for HPC clusters, also has a really nice web interface. And this is like, for example, on the user side, what you would have to do to share something, to publish, a data set um, and then for us to consume it. So this, is, this happened on the American side. We ingested it and then people could plot it and people can plot it until we delete it essentially. Yeah, sorry, that was already here. Yeah, now this is a different, so this was, this was plotting now. And so this um, plotting is probably a good use case for open science, peer review, uh, sharing papers, um, doing the actual physics, or in this case, physics. And now the question is, so how do you spread the word about HPC, get new users onboarded, new group members, new PhD students, whatever you want. Now, we talked about building being hard. What you see on this slide is we are doing a CMake. A CMake is essentially an instruction to build hyperfocus to build code into something you can then execute. And in this case, if you look closely, you'll see this is written in Fortran, which is a still very popular in this field language. Otherwise it's typically viewed as antiquated and extremely outdated. Um, the point is that it, it tends to have, um, especially in research, very specific dependencies that may not build, or even if it builds, it might not work. And what you see in this picture is that we've, basically um, packaged into this web interface, all the dependencies such that if you do the build, you can actually interactively work and run test cases inside that environment. So this is something you see on the right. This is where the code is actually running. It's computing something, um, magnetic field density, for example. And so what you could do here is you could really teach people how to use the code based on uh, smallish models, of course. So in this case, I think we have 32 cores quota. So it's not gonna work. It's not a real cluster. It's not a real HPC cluster. It's just a small runtime, but we'll be able to, again, take away all this making the code, building the code with the right compiler. If you look at the left, you see that this is a specific version of the Intel compiler 2160-2022, blah, 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 with a particular wrapper of HDF5, blah. So this is all taken care of already and also check that these versions match. And now students or interested users can play with the code, can see how maybe the magnetic flux density changes if you do something. Here. Yeah, so this would conclude the actual use case. So this would be a, again, great point if somebody has questions or is interested in, in using this. Otherwise, a little bit about what we needed to do to make this possible. So we see Jupyter as a web runtime with strong controls. So we adapted the upstream Jupyter, so the one that is open sourced and that many many universities use it to include um, different ways of handling groups. So we can do this federated login easier. And we also have the strong secure, um, a much more strong security posture when we, when we run the containers than you would typically um, encounter. The other thing that we have um, that is custom is we have this Kubernetes operator that allows us to do quota enforcement per 
published image. And this is quite nifty because that way we can really say it's the same cluster, but we're giving this person six CPUs, the other person gets 60 CPUs, um, and we don't have to change actually the underlying infrastructure. And future, so this is by far not finished, future work is to, to do even more in the, in the access management to really make it transparent to an end user. And also to let the research groups handle the internal user access themselves. This is currently not, not properly implemented yet. And then work on extensions of Jupyter, like 3D rendering, GPU support. And this is something we will do with research groups. So we don't do generic use cases. We work with specific users to solve their concrete problems. So that's coming in the future. Uh, this is a little bit about what actually is Kubernetes under, underneath. It orchestrates these containers, makes things extremely scalable. It is very, very extensible. Um, I'll actually do the demo in the end, so I'll have a demo for, for how we extended this um, and make these, these drop downs um, customizable if you want to see it. And I think so, yeah. There we go. So, what is special about ours? So, um, when we do open science, we assume that the audience is large. And while not maybe completely public, it's we cannot control, we don't want to control who looks at such a runtime. So we have to really keep in mind that these clusters will have issues of being attacked from random uh, sources simply because they have to be relatively public, they're relatively exposed. So we have to, or we have chosen to build them for compromise. Um, what we've chosen to do is to orchestrate everything in such a way that the, the lifespans of absolutely everything that has to do with the runtime is very, very short. So we can kill something um, and basically make sure that nobody polluted this environment, or even if they polluted it completely, they get wiped and we can reinstantiate the, the environment cleanly. This is, from our perspective, very, very important, especially on if you're running it on a, a university infrastructure, because you do not want to give nasty people a way into your infrastructure simply because you're doing open science. That would, I think, really defeat the purpose. So, and this is something we want to take care of. The other thing we do is this externalized storage. We, we um, try to very much make it possible to have the storage completely separate from the runtime. And the cool thing about that is, is that you keep your data with you um, and also with your identity. It doesn't matter so much where you log in from or where you geographically are, if you move a uh, university, for example, or institution. And what we really try to design everything for is so translatability that is really for academic use. We try to make it low cost. So also our tool choice is that we, you have so many options. We try to choose things that will not incur undue cost and also in terms of human cost, like make it easy to maintain, make it easy to read, make it simple to translate also from mental model to mental model. Yeah, I think I've talked about it um, that, and I want to just uh, focus on that point one more time. We cannot just open up our science use our science runtimes to to the public without being duly afraid of that something might go wrong. And the the key part, the key three part that we wanted to to make sure and that we provide with these blueprints is that underneath the whole infrastructure, these three points that the network is segregated, meaning that people cannot break out of a lab into the university infrastructure that people cannot use the data to access other points on clusters inside the university or wherever they are hosted. And that inside this application, people are contained therein. They cannot go deeper down into these lower layers. Those are the three things we wanna really ensure. And a lot of work, I would say more than 50% of our work is actually in these non-functional requirements in order to make the usability good for the end user. And I think it was a nice finding last year that most of this has been implemented really well. We still have to do more work on, 
on the data side. So current, this is why currently we only release this for public and non-personal identifiable data um, as content. Right, so this is the summary and now I really have to fix my Zoom because I can't see it. Oops. Right, so to summarize all that I've said so far, what is important to us or to me is that we abstract the open science in a way that the researchers can focus on their research and engineers can focus on engineering in such a way that they enable um, a smooth and transparent user experience. Because we believe that that is the only way to make this scalable and for people to actually use it. And the thing that I'm personally afraid of is that we do open science and then we get compromised or breached by adversaries simply because we wanted to share something. That is something that I am very much like caring about that we don't accidentally shoot ourselves here in the leg. And the idea of the, or the approach is to make it in such a way that institutes can have their own digital sovereignty of choice. So we give examples that work for real use cases. However, try to make it such that you can exchange individual components because they are standard based and it will very likely still work. And the idea is, and also for the humans to make it scalable, is these train the trainer programs. So I think we can call this a success if we manage to expose our users only to such a small level of, of technical detail about all this cloud computing stuff that within a couple of weeks, we can have researchers teach other researchers to use these open science labs, and they don't have to take a half a year course on, for example, Kubernetes first. So that's, um, that's really the goal here. Yeah, if you are interested in any of this, we are looking forward to working with other teams this year. And yeah, this is going to be interesting. What is the next code base after the magnetohydrodynamics? Now, coming to a completely different topic. So we said we had problems staffing our own team. And, you know, uh, sometimes from despair, there come good ideas. So we basically said, well, why don't we actually teach this on a like real university level course? Um, and what teach what is um, cloud, cloud native, DevOps and security, the stuff that we need to be able to do to um, enable others to use our cloud, but also for the industry to have these workers ready that very, very often are used both in startups, financial services, and, and other companies very, very much in demand. So the ideas of this class, and it is happening starting in March this year, um, hosted at the TOV in, with a collaboration from the University of Innsbruck. I think it's going to be co-hosted in Innsbruck and participating will also be the BU and the BOKU. So the idea is to have a bit of theory because you, you'll never get out. You, you can not, not do any theory. So have really the best practices shown, but then use this infrastructure and have long sessions where the students in groups work on their own application. So they're supposed to basically fund a startup fund their own application and work with all this messy layers and all these real life problems to build their own application with us there, um, giving them reference solutions and, and debugging the, the code with them essentially. The original challenges and still challenges are how we make this scalable um, and simply how we host lectures for students across many universities. This is logistically not super simple, but I think we're on a, on a really good path. Um, so, so how does this fit into what we said before? How is it different? So actually up to the blue layer, it's almost identical. So the only thing is that we changed is the, is the orange layer on top where we have a different profile now. 
So instead of installing Jupyter, which was the teaching and oh, which interactive web shell, we now install actually a game. Um, maybe you remember that in the bottom there is Pac-Man. You remember this game? So it's our sample application. Um, and this application is built with like all bells and whistles attached. So, so basically we demonstrate all the things we want to teach on this Pac-Man application. That means we need a lot of auxiliary auxiliary um, tools as well. And those we put on those profiles um, and make them installable so that once you choose, for example, the, the profile build system, you get this nice space dog, for example, which is called Tekton, which is a cloud native CI system. Um, whatever these, these, these symbols actually stand for, the idea is that we can build these clusters, not just for researchers, but also for our own purpose. And in case the students demand certain tools to be there, or demand, I mean, if we find that it's, it's useful to teach something, we can share this in many, many clusters. These clusters are actually going to be very small, many clusters to many students that live for a couple of hours, and then we just shut them down. And this whole identity federation, the sharing of data that we talked about earlier, is, is really the same. It's just this time for university students and we're playing Pac-Man, we're not playing Pac-Man. Uh, we are using Pac-Man as a reference application because it's very, very simple and very clear cut um, to teach all the stuff around, all this automation, security, um, policies, and certificate management, and secrets management, all these things that are on the lower level and are really important. Um, and the idea is to, to do it in a, in a gamified and uh, playful way somewhat. Yeah, the the idea here is, and this is a simple uh, similar picture to before, is we, we use this on-demand infrastructure with a profile, but now we also have an idea for the exams. So I don't know if you've ever heard of CTFs, Capture the Flag, so it's a children's game, this is another game. Um, it's The question is, so how do you test this? How do you test that somebody has learned um, how to deal with all of these small applications. Well, there are one way at least that I think is, is possible is to basically host a scavenger hunt or a interactive set of challenges where they find broken systems. They'll find different pieces of systems that are broken and they have to fix them. And whenever they fix something, they get a so-called flag, which then they can enter into a system and say, well, here's my flag, I found the answer. So it's not an answer, it's just a keyword. And they have to write a little bit about how they found it. And so we can hopefully really test that somebody has understood how a system works and they have this, this challenge-like environment online. So the other thing that I think is gonna be important is to let people invent their own construct. So rather than teaching, frontally with a lot of theory. The idea is let's get the students into a real life um, situation where they have to build an application. So, and not just build it, they don't, they have to build it, they have to deploy it, they have to host it, they keep it alive to monitor the thing, probably it's gonna die. And, and also to work in a team together. So, because the teamwork aspect is, I think today, incredibly important to just learn so well it was your job to deal with the network it was my job to deal with i don't know what was my job uh to deal with the build process and now it failed like how do we handle frustration blame and how are many of these processes that we see in cloud native all these automation integrations we have so many different ways of doing it like what are the best ways to really make a team gel and work together and make the choices and or actually that the choices that we make that work well often have to do to do with the human aspects and not so much with the technology aspects that ultimately all these fancy bnc um logos here are meaningless unless we a provide applications that that bring value and b that we work together on them in a way that um, that the processes give us the ability to to publish um, a well um, stabilized or stable um, service to others right and um, when we teach this 
one more thing that I think is going to be important or that I would like to impart is that cloud native means almost means open source and open source often or could be when you start with it you might not realize that there are actual humans behind open source projects and this is something that I would also like to, to stress is how how you should interact with other maintainers when a feature doesn't work or something or you would like to contribute something how do you actually contribute in a meaningful and productive way to other people's source code right so the way we um, will teach this is to have a lot of time because we so we'll take eight hours per week um, small groups and and really give people a lot of, of time to invent their own applications to go deep and also to fail so to have ideas and go through them multiple times probably and the one thing the way the one we want to cover theory parts is actually to build a concept completely from scratch for example a container runtime from first principle rather than teaching um, slides so much um, on on the other um, hand on the week sorry on the other day of the week we would like to expose them to that overabundance of tooling that you find in a typical cloud stack where then they have to find their way and build their own application up together as a team yeah key choices here are and i think i've um mostly talked about this before uh maybe the one thing is i think it's really important to create this playful atmosphere and to uh you know both in the exams as well as in in the labs to to create and to focus on enjoying failing and i would say that if if we get that across in the in the lecture then i'll be very happy so maybe as a summary here for the teaching we were never this was never a part this was never a goal of this project to teach cloud native but it sort of came out naturally and a lot of people have actually given the feedback even if i'm not a student i might be an industry uh sorry um an institute administrator or institute staff can can we actually join i think there's a lot of, of stuff that is useful here and yes you can if if the students are not full you can join and of course i would like to of course open source all of the material that people um as long as they are from nonprofit organizations can do these exams these games these whatever we publish there also uh, in self-service ways probably this is going to take us a while but that's the idea and so to just make also the learning here scalable right so just from the structure perspective it's going to be three blocks starting in march we'll have occasionally um experts joining us and the key part is the um well the exercises to build together from from the sample applications and that the exams from the very beginning is clear that we have both the fact that the, the, the way to pass the class is to have either to have both a presentation on what you learned on how you failed well in your startup um, and to also play three times this this CTF game and <clears throat> and prove that you can sort of repair a, uh, a system when you find it broken in a way that you previously saw it in an exercise right so the um these capture the flag exams are typically they come from actually security as well and it's a collaboration that we currently have ongoing with the department for informatics uh, security and privacy and the idea here um that like the vision is that we can host um these these um challenges as well and share them in a, in a sort of a catalog and share them with other people as well now you might say well that's a bit weird if 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 you have basically an exam question catalog um the possible idea is that it's actually not helpful that you know the questions up front really um, unless you know the exact question and we'll see how that works 
yeah, this is actually what the scoreboard looks like. And yeah, so that would be the the um the lecture starting in March this year. So again, pausing here if anybody is has any questions at this point. Right. The next part and last part is a self-supporting community. So we now have a new name. We're called the Austrian Open Cloud Community. And how do we envision going forward to also get input and collaborations and feedback from other people? So the idea is now we have something that works, right? But it's still a baby. It's, it's still development. I do believe that I really do believe in iteration and feedback and learning also from challenges. So I think that having it now out in the open where people can say, well, this works, but that thing really doesn't work for me. Like, uh, or can I actually contribute my idea here? For example, you don't like OpenStack. So you want to work on Azure Cloud or you want to work on Google Cloud because you have money there. Um, so how would we support having this exact same user experience on two different clouds? It's something that I'm pretty sure will come very soon. But we want to work with actual users that actually have the need so we can test it, not just because maybe somebody needs it. And this is why now we have this all open sourced. This is the, the link is going to be in a couple of slides. Um, you can look at it. We're going to write some document, documentation is a bit, uh, not so much because it's only a week out there. Um, and we are also working on providing more tests and a lot of working examples so that you can really say, ah, if, if I use this, then I can use this, this uh, application, for example, this Open Science Lab or um, the Pac-Man app. It will simply work. And I can copy paste as much as I can if I don't have the time or I don't care to change it. And this is another uh, interesting change that will come this year with, with our project is that we focus a little bit more on I don't want to call it consulting because that sounds super like private sector. But the idea is that if you're interested, we would really want to work with you. Like, how could that work at another institute? Or what are your specifics? How can we integrate this with others? And how can we avoid reinventing the wheel? Which I think in the Western university landscape, it is a bit of an issue that, I mean, let's just say we could work a bit more together. And so this is... This is our idea just to put it out there. And for you, if you don't like it, particularly you don't like certain aspects for you to be able to criticize us while you can still benefit from all the other things. And so do reach out to us if, if that's at all of interest to you. These are all the links and this is my last slide. Um, just going through it, the, the repositories that you saw, first link, we do have a web page, which we keep relatively up to date. Um, the most you'll probably get out of the Slack, the chat, which you can you can join every Wednesday at 3 p.m. There's a completely open session where you can ask questions. You can also um, ask questions up front or ask for a demo of something, um, get in touch. And there is also the classical email and social media. Yeah. So that brings me to the end. and. I hope that you learned something. Um, maybe you're interested, do reach out. But in any case, again, Happy New Year and thank you so much for your time and to listen. Thank you, Constanze. Um... Yes, I think we can open the floor to questions if there are any. If you wanna, if you want Constanza to show you something in a bit more detail, perhaps. There's some applause happening. <laughs> Very well deserved. Okay. 
I'm guessing, Constanza, you covered everything so thoroughly that there are no more questions today. That is more than fine. Yeah, so I will simply leave you with the links. So if there are ever any questions, Wednesdays 3 p.m., drop us a line. And otherwise, have a great rest of your week. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you so much, Constanza, for, uh, for the lovely webinar. I'm just going to show all of you the, the information about our next two webinars in the series, which um, the next one is already in two weeks on January 24th, covering the web-based platform for reproducible computational analysis called Galaxy organized by the Medical University of Graz. And then we have a uh, the last webinar of this semester on, um, on uh, data from the energy sector at universities. And that one will be and being interested in both our sister projects and um, I'm going to remind you that we will um, post the recording on YouTube and on um, on the website in the coming days and I will let all of you know and send you the link very soon so thank you and have a have a great day <laughs>